So we're talking today about a household of love with the idea is that this, God loves families. Did you know that God created us through family? He wants us to live in family. He wants to live for family. In Psalm 80, 68, the sixth verse, says this, God sets the solitary in families. But not every family meets the picture of the ideal family. Fact is, there is only one ideal family, and it's not mine, okay? It's God himself. You can say, you know, not only does God love families, God is family because you're Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Three persons, but one being, one essence. The relationship between Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the oneness that is there is so absolutely perfect. And when he made Adam and Eve in his image, and you'll be hearing more about that next week from Pastor Dreyer, when he created people in his image, it was with the idea that the man and the woman should become one. He wants families to be one, households to be one. And God has a family. So God loves families, God is family, and God has a family. He's a father, he's got kids, you and I. And we are brothers and sisters in this family. And um, we are given birth through the womb of the church, the bride of Christ, God the Son. And um, he then takes care of us. He loves us, he nurtures us, he supports us, he is with us all the time. That's the church, the household of God. As a matter of fact, the church in the Bible sometimes is referred to as the household of God. You wanna hear the Greek word for that household? It's ekonomia. Did I say economy? Well, that's where we get the word economy. It's a, it's a basic economy unit in which things really happen. It's that, uh, then that's what the household of God is, the family of God. Uh, Though sometimes it doesn't look like very much of a family, the household of God is meant to be a community of love. And within it, we discover those three P's that we've been talking about this year and we'll continue to talk about. The P of finding, first of all, your person. That's your identity. Second is your people, which is your community. The third is your purpose. What is your meaning in life? And God intends that people find that through the household of God, the church. But keep in mind, the church is not just some you know, another one of those organizations that people may look at, say, oh, that's a, not a bad thing, but, you know, uh, I can either join, not join, be part of it or not part of it, but the church, is, it suits them, but the church is not an organization. Yeah, come around here, we're not organized. Okay, the church is not an organization, but what is it? It is a living organism, yeah. So church is not just something you go to. Church is what we are. It is made up of so many parts, all those working together in harmony, synchronized by the head of that body, which is Jesus Christ. He's got all the brains. He is the one who sends forth the impulses. And literally, this household of God, the church, becomes the platform, the framework through which God is doing his work of restoring a world that, you know, it got fatally injured when it fell you know, in, the, in the fall of Adam and Eve. And it's still hurting a great deal. Now, what I want to do in this message this morning is make some comparisons between families that we experience in real life and the family of God or the household of God. Now, keep in mind, as Shannon pointed out with, uh, with Kenna here, as they were building those little houses, uh, there are, there's no perfect household. There really isn't. Now, how many people would you say are associated with, uh, say, yeah, Ablaze, that's my church. There are about 110 people say, yeah, that's my church. Okay, uh, are there problems? Yeah, we've got at least 110 problems in, in this church. You see how, how that kind of works. And uh, so we're not the perfect church. There's no perfect family. But though the church is imperfect, God chooses to use that to address 
the world with his love and grace. Now we're gonna look at a number of characteristics of healthy households, and then we're gonna apply that to the church. And so I, I looked at uh, you know where people uh, go dig into that and they describe it, and I came up with five traits of strong families, the five traits. The first is this, that strong families express appreciation. They don't tear each other down. A strong family, appreciation, affirmation, support, care, affection. Each one is valued, each one is respected. Did you grow up in a family like that? If you did, hey, what a great thing. But you know, not everybody, maybe not even the majority, grow up in a family like that. Um, What about the family you're in now? Is it a lot like that? Uh, Or... Think about this. Did you ever feel as a kid that maybe you could never quite measure up to what the expectations were? That instead of appreciation being expressed, there was always, yeah, uh, say, okay, so you got all A's, but when are you ever going to learn how to, you know, that, that kind of a thing? It never really was good enough. And that affection was conditional upon something. Now, think about the household of God. If we a strong family where we express appreciation for each other. Let's go to a second trait of strong families, and that is strong families have a strong commitment to each other. There is a sense of belonging. There is a deep sense of security. The opposite of that would be that... Uh, the feeling that things could come apart at just about any moment. Somebody is going to probably be bailing out. It's not safe, it's not secure, it's not stable. Uh, You're never sure if you really belonged, and if you did, was it something worth belonging to? Now, what about the household of God? What about his family, his church? Are we a strong family where we have a strong commitment to each other? Where that becomes, you know, a very, very strong factor in your your thoughts, your behavior, your participation. Okay, we'll go to a third characteristic, third trait of strong families. Strong families spend enjoyable time together. Yeah, a lot of families spend time together but don't really enjoy it. But in a strong family, they stick together, they're bonded, they make being together a priority without you know, the, all that messy stuff of getting all enmeshed with each other. They plan activities. Now, the opposite would be where family members tolerate each other as best. And when they get together as family, there's always that sense of tension, you know. Who, what kind of craziness is going to be breaking out here? Uh, and where other things are a whole lot more important than family being together and enjoying that time. Uh, the family table is almost non-existent, and if we're going to have to get together, you're going to have to, you know, throw out some guilt uh, that if you don't do what uh, what Mama says you got to do, there's going to be a problem. Now think about the household of God. Are we a strong family where we? Enjoy spending time together. Good question. Okay, if you were rating it and you hold up the card, you know, from one, uh, somewhere from one and ten, you know, like uh, in the gymnastics, you know, would it be a ten? Hmm, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Okay, let's go to the fourth one, and that is strong families manage stress and crisis. It's not a matter whether or not there will be stress or crisis, even in an almost perfect church like a blaze, okay? There will be, but in strong families, there is open communication rather than blocked communication like, oh, oh, no, no, don't say that. Oh, what do you mean by, you know, that's blocking the communication. And um, in a strong family, people can cope even when things are not going perfectly well, whether it's big issues or little issues. Conflict is resolved in a win-win kind of a fashion. The opposite is that things quickly get pretty nasty and there are small problems that become crisis before you know it. There's blaming, there is a silent treatment, heaps of drama. Everybody gets hurt, everybody gets offended, everybody gets disappointed, and uh, the elephant in the room is not really ever addressed. Oh, well, what about 
household of God, managing stress and crisis effectively, not if it comes, but when it comes. Uh, uh, Here's the fifth one, and that is strong families have a sense of spiritual well-being. Now, I found this in secular sources, that that was a a repeated kind of a thing. A strong family, there is a sense of spiritual well-being where families... Uh, the values are clear. They're frequently communicated. There are core beliefs that are shared uh, that guide the directions and decisions. The opposite of that would be faith is not shared at all, or if it is, it's only kind of on a, a very frivolous and kind of a marginal basis. There may even be some church going, but it's not anywhere near a priority or it doesn't form any sense of community for the people. Uh, Family prayer is, again, greatly neglected. Decisions are made in a purely secular kind of a rational kind of a way rather than prayerfully and say, hey, Lord, you have, you have a plan for us? We'd like to know how should we, you know, what should we be doing? And then lifestyles that are just not based on biblical values. Now, again, what about church? What about family, household of God? Sense of spiritual well-being? Oh, well, Oh, yeah, we have the Bible every week, you know, something to read. Does that mean we have spiritual well-being? You know, people can kind of go and do the thing and go through the outward motions, but maybe not really getting very deep into the heart. Well, there are way too many households of the world that are in a great deal of trouble, probably almost more that are in trouble than those that aren't. And you wonder, yeah, there is no wonder, let's say, that there are so many people that are hurting and they're longing for community. Now, there are certain things that make families dysfunctional, and uh, you can describe it as, you know, where there's conflict and misbehavior and abuse. Relationships between family members are tense and strains, filled with neglect, and then there's yelling and screaming or a very deep silence. You might feel forced to happily accept all that mistreatment, and uh, there's a shutdown along with that of the higher mental functions and everybody kind of operating in reptilian brain, you know, like a bunch of lizards hanging out together. Uh, No open space to express their thoughts and the feelings freely. Underlying problems, what could there be? Sometimes there are generational secrets. Hmm. And they just continue to eat away and eat away and eat away. Um, Generational secrets. They're about resentments that never get resolved. And and if you've got one of those resentments, you expect everybody else to buy into your resentment so that the family, you know, continues on with, say, you know, a very resentful group of people. Um, Abuse, alcoholism, but we'll not talk about that. We'll keep that secret. We'll you know, make, enable you to continue on doing what you're doing. Irresponsibility. And sometimes there's mental illness, you know, for which you can't blame anybody. Poverty, unemployment. No faith. That's the worst one. A mar- or a, at best, a marginal Jesus who really is not very present or evident and really doesn't do anything much in the lives. And there are trends that are ongoing that are affecting families. One is that there are, it seems like increasing numbers of kids living in single parent families due to a high rate of divorce, increased childbearing outside of marriage, fathers just bailing out. And then we see also a general breakdown of society. You know, the values, the morals, uh, the things that we ought to be taking for granted that are part of an orderly and a godly society, just kind of not, not there. And if you bring those up, you're kind of laughed out of the room. You're not very woke then. Okay, what about, uh, what about the family of God, the household of God? What would be some characteristics or features of robustly, healthy, functioning churches? Huh. Now, first one might surprise you, uh, but let's ask what kind of a church should we be, could we be, what does God want? Well, the first characteristic is that everyone in it is a sinner. Huh? (laughs) Yeah, okay. So you know what that means? We got a bunch of imperfect people dealing with 
imperfect people. That's just how it is. We are all sinners. As, as a matter of fact, if it wouldn't be for sinners, we couldn't have a church. You, really thought, you realize that? There would be no church. So that's the first thing we've got in common. And you know what? Also, things that we'll be having in common, we're all going to get hurt somewhere along the line. We're going to be a little disappointed. Uh, you're either going to be gossiping or being gossiped about or both, okay? Passed over <laughs> when the goodies are handed out. Uh, toxic elements. You know what? Isn't that just like living in real life in a real family? You know, so a whole bunch of sinners say, hey, let's get together. Let's be church. All right. We got to know what we're dealing with. But here's, here's the, 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 the counterpoint to this in that every one of the sinners has a savior, which means we all get to be forgiven and we all get to be forgiving. Okay? You're under obligation to forgive me when I screw up. All right? I'm under obligation to forgive you when you do. All right? Hey, let's just be open about it. That's how it works. Now, biblical examples of forgiveness, like the forgiving father, the son had really messed up and gone far away. He came back. Dad said, I love you. <laughs> Welcome back to the family. Uh, a, a servant who owned his, owed his master a great deal of money, and he got forgiven. Jesus from the cross saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Joseph, remember that story, what his brothers did to him? You know, they, they, they captured him, bound him, threw him in a pit. They were going to kill him. And then they said, oh, no, we'll sell him be a slave so he can have torture the rest of his life. Now, what did, what did Joseph do? Did he forgive them finally when those brothers showed up? I think he forgave them right away. If he hadn't, you know, he would have been so seething in resentment and desire to get even and to get that revenge, he would never have survived being in prison. He would never have survived, you know, uh, to get to that point where he was second in command of the whole kingdom of Egypt. Okay. There was forgiveness. Okay. And everyone needs forgiveness. There's not one single person in the sound of my voice or anywhere in the world that doesn't need forgiveness. Now, what does it mean when we forgive someone? It means that whatever has happened between the people is now put in the past. The pain may still be felt. All right. That doesn't mean you didn't forgive, but when you remember, you remember to forget again. Okay. Uh, and it's all on, the, uh, on account of Christ. You, see, you can't do this on your own. It's not possible. We need to depend upon the Holy Spirit. First of all, reveal to us where we're still you know, being a mess about that whole thing. And then the whole, uh, to, for us to actually let go and to be, again, like Joseph was with his brothers. Okay, love given by the Holy Spirit flowing into us, and it says in 1 Corinthians 13 that love keeps no record of wrongs, but it's only through Christ that this is a possibility. Do you know, think of the cross where Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Do you know that the, the ground is level around the cross? It is. All of us equally sinners, all of us equally forgiven. That's how the ground is around the cross. And here's another little secret, and that is the closer we all get to the cross, guess what also goes along with that? We're closer to each other. So here's how it works, you know, forgiveness. Now, also, uh, another characteristic or feature of a healthy church is that everybody counts. Everybody matters. Again, we're all equal in the sight of God. Therefore, we are equal in the sight of each other. There is no in-group and there are no outsiders, at least not with God. And if it happens, this happened in churches, huh? Yeah, okay. But we have the, the resources of the word of God to correct that, to address it, and to bring it back in alignment with what God wants for us. So because we are a community of shared values, shared values, yeah, we have the same relationship rules, and as part of our mission statement, love God, love others. 
okay? And then follow Jesus, etc. But you get the point. That is the one relationship rule, love others. And um, we agree. The Bible is, you know, the word of God. The Bible, from cover to cover, it, and what it says is what we believe about relationships with each other and the conflicts that come about then. Conflicts and disagreements are prevented the more we focus on Jesus and then resolved when they come up. Not if they come up, but when they do. Because that Bible has the rule over us, the authority over us, and what it says, that is what we are called to do. That's our standard. We also have a standard of doctrine, okay? What is it we believe about all the various issues? Uh, for example, one of the things we did was we, we said the words of the creed. Hmm. That's a confession of faith. And then as we go along, you know, there are, are deeper and more detailed things like that. And when we come together as a church, say, so you know what, I'm not going to undermine that. Now, we sometimes are going to take, have a little different take on this issue or that issue. Does that separate us? Does that divide us? No. We seek the Holy Spirit together who brings harmony uh, and we, as we humbly seek the guidance of the Lord so that we may not get uniformity. The fact is, why do we want uniformity? But we can certainly have unity and be together in good harmony. Now, Paul writes about all of these things. I want to just give you a couple of excerpts from some of his letters, all right? First of all, in his uh, letter to the church at Philippi, in the fourth chapter, in the second verse, this is what he says. I entreat you, Odia, and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. You want my paraphrase? Stop your bickering, okay? <laughs> says, well, how are we going to resolve it? He says, real simple. I got two words for you. Stop it. Oh, okay. Then, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, I mean, chapter 2, verse 23, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. You know, it's like, you know, just simply intuitive. That brings, the, there are the quarrels. And then we stand together. Now, uh, we have a little blessing that comes at the end of the service, uh, and for this year, it's one that goes with the, these words, it says, may we be devoted to one another in love. May we outdo one another in showing honor. Hmm. So, let's go to Ephesians in the fourth chapter, verse 32. It says, be kind to one another. Tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. And, and one more, Colossians 3.14. This is, we heard this one earlier. And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Whoa. Household of God, the church. And when we see what... The Bible describes as that harmonious household. Now, by extension, may that go to every household in your own homes where that's represented. And during the month of May, we're going to be visiting a lot of different places, different households. We're going to see some really cool households. We're going to see some that were really bad. Um, next week, Mother's Day, huh? You want to be here? All right. Hey, take an invite card to someone. Say, come on. Oh, and we'll have a little something, a little treat for moms too on that day.